This video is sponsored by Setbird. If you've been following along with this series, what the is this, you know we've covered a lot of ground from deep sea alien looking specimens to animals that are technically immortal, cannibals, toxic creatures, and a variety of objectively unpleasant species. Well, this episode will be the worst of all. Because as we know, the internet is filled with viral videos of mystery creatures that look gross, seem gross, and make you question, what else do I not know about if I just found out about this? I'm gonna introduce you to a few of them. Explaining it might make you feel more at ease about their existence, or it'll make you question your own. We'll see what happens. Ah, sweet! And please, I will only say this once, do not eat while watching this video. Consider it a sincere warning. It's time for another episode of What the F*** Is This? Worms and Maggots Edition. Before we get into it, uh, let me state the obvious. I have a different hat on. I left the safari hat in my friend's car and I just realized about 20 minutes ago. I spent the last 20 minutes panicking about it, put on the beanie, and this is what we're working with today. So, this won't happen again. Is that all I have to say? Uh, I'll do better next time. As always, we're gonna get the general information out of the way. Surprise, surprise, like every other video in this series, it is a bunch of invertebrates. More worms. And, of course, we're throwing a maggot into the mix. Invertebrates take up the vast majority of animals on this planet, as you can see in our beloved Kaleidogram, which represents how big groups of animals called phyla are related to each other. All but one phyla are invertebrates. And at least eight of those phyla are worms. To refresh your memory on the other video we spent talking about various worms. Clearly there's something ideal about the worm body form. Maybe it's that they can reach cracks and crevices that other animals can't. Just slide right in. Or maybe they're up to something that we're unaware of. Regardless, evolution obviously likes the worm form. They live in every habitat imaginable, from the deep sea tube worms at the hydrothermal vent to the Russian nematodes that maybe survived cryptobiosis for 36,000 years. Some can get chopped up into tiny little pieces and regenerate as several identical worms, and some even bark like dogs. Who's a good boy? Who's a good boy? However, not everything that looks like a worm is a real worm, because nature doesn't like to give shit to you straight. Oftentimes, they are the larva of some sort of insect, like inchworms, not real worms, or maggots that arguably look like thick blunt worms. Maggots are the larva of flies, specifically. Every fly started off life as a maggot. House flies, cheese flies, fruit flies, you name it. They all pretty much look like this. Dude, one time I was helping my friend move into her new place and we woke up to about a thousand maggots in the kitchen. It was terrible. And now she has my hat. Despite preferring to have them not living in your home, maggots have been important in not just ecological ways. They helped disprove spontaneous generation. This idea that things can just spawn into existence, like fish in a river, or rats in an attic, or maggots on rotting meat. People used to think they just respawned there. And spontaneous generation was kind of just accepted as a thing from 400 BCE to the 1600s. And then this physician named Francesco Reddy was like, nope, no way, not a thing. It's false, no way. Not this time. And in 1668, put meat in different types of covered containers and proved that maggots didn't appear unless the flies were able to lay eggs inside of the container. Thus, spontaneous generation is false. And then it had to be super disproven later on by a different guy. But anyway, a round of applause to maggots for contributing to advancements in scientific understanding. And before I introduce you to today's maggot, I wanna do one of the worms first. We're gonna go worm, maggot, worm. So here's the first worm. That is a collective mass of tubifex worms, also called sludge worms or sewage worms. They're in the phylum Annelida, so they're related to leeches, earthworms, and bristleworms that we talked about in the other worm episode of this series. Annelids are segmented worms. They have little repeating body segments that they extend and contract to move around. You know how earthworms move? They kind of like reach out extending their body and then they slingshot forward. That was a dramatic way to describe it, but you know what the fuck is going on. There's over 15,000 species of annelid worms and 16 of them are tubifex worms in their own little genus. Tubifex worms are found in mud, lake floor, sediment, sludge, sewage, hence their other nicknames. Anywhere they can find decaying material, they fuck with. Polluted water with no oxygen kills everything else? Fuck it, why not? They love living in squalor, clinging onto the sludge while they feast on it. But sometimes they don't have enough sludge to cling onto and so they cling onto each other forming compact, giant, pulsating blobs, like the one seen in the video that brought us here today. They'll also do this in response to changing environmental conditions, like temperature and water currents. It's a stress response. They get stressed out, hold on to each other real tight, which sounds cute until you see it. It just looks like something humans were never supposed to see. You know? But they've been useful to humans in a variety of different ways. First, historically, they have been great 
live fish food. So I guess you could technically see that as more of a benefit to fish than humans, but it depends on your perspective, I guess. They're a good source of protein and easy to breathe. So good fish food. You just, of course, have to be careful where the tube effects worms came from. You shouldn't feed them to fish if they came from sewage and sludge, because that's about 110% bacteria and parasites. And because they're often found in bodies of the worst water possible, they're a good indicator of water quality. See tube effects worms, think I will not drink that. And they're also studied in labs for a variety of different reasons, because they can survive in such horrific conditions, filled with all different types of pollutants and bacteria. So they're seeing if they could possibly be used in bioremediation, breaking down pollutants in different systems. All right, that's the first one. How are we feeling? Do you feel better or worse? Now that you know what the fuck is going on, let me know in the comments. And before moving on to the next creature in our lineup, let me tell you about today's sponsor, Scentbird. Scentbird is a fragrance subscription service that lets you discover new colognes and perfumes every month without having to commit to a full bottle. They have all different kinds of scents from feminine, masculine, unisex, designer, indie, and more that you can try every month for just 17 bucks. Every month you get to pick what you receive, so there are no surprises. Over the years, I would personally only buy one scent at a time because the bottles are so big and expensive, which was annoying because I would get sick of it after a while, but then I would keep using it because I didn't want to waste it. But with Scentbird, now I can have the variety that I want of multiple scents to choose from in little portable containers that let me decide what scent I feel like based on my mood that day. And the samples are big. They give you a 30 day supply of each scent, so it lasts a long time. Let me tell you the ones that I got this month. Usually I like earthy and woody scents, mint, vanilla, but I wanted to try something new. So I got Lamu, which is more coconut and lemon and sage. I wasn't sure if I was gonna like it when I picked it out, but luckily it's low risk because of Scentbird. So let's try. Here's how you use the bottle. Twist, and spray. Mm. I like this one. It's like you're on an Italian beach with gelato before dinner, because you can't. All right, and the next one, Kion, in this cute little white container. I really like them, they're so cute. I got this one because it has mint. I like that because it smells really clean. And also cedar and fir, so you can see why I got it. Yeah, that's the one. I love it. It's like a fresh morning on the mountain in December. Your nose is a little cold, but in a good way. I will definitely be using this when I go out. And if you want to try them out for yourself or maybe discover something new, you can use my coupon code Lindsay55 for 55% off at Semper for your first month. Available in the USA and Canada. That comes out to just a little bit over $7 for your first month. Thank you, Semper, for sponsoring this video. Check out their products at the link in the description. All right, now it smells delicious as we move on to today's maggot. Guys, my tampon looks weird. Oh my God, what is that? If you've followed me for a while, you already know what the fuck is going on. These are called hoverfly larvae, also known as rat-tailed maggots. Rat-tailed maggots. Ooh, that one was really aggressive. Rat-tailed maggots. <laughs> Unlike our other blunty, wormy maggots that we're typically familiar with, these ones look like rats. That tail is a tube called a siphon that they use to breathe while they're underwater because they are of the aquatic variety. Aquatic maggots. It's not a tail, it's a snorkel. They're often found in putrid and rotten water because they don't give a fuck. They have a snorkel. They can handle the sewage lagoons and cesspools with ease. They're also found on rotting vegetation and sometimes inside of toilets. Rat-tailed maggots are the larva of a number of different species of fly. The one that's usually talked about is the common drone fly. What's it called again? Let's see. Aristolus, Aristolus tenax. That's the common drone fly. But there are other hoverfly species that start life as a maggot with a snorkel. And they grow up to kind of look like bees and hover around like bees. This was likely a defensive adaptation, looking like a tough guy to scare off the other tough guys, even though you belong across the street at Weenie Hut Jr. Are you saying I belong at Weenie Hut Jr.'s? And like I had mentioned, this isn't the first time I've ever talked about rat-tailed maggots. I'm gonna fucking lose my voice. It's possible that you found me through talking about them. I've made several TikToks over the last couple of years whenever they go viral again, explaining just a fraction of what I've described already. Actually, usually I've just kept it to saying they're rat-tailed maggots. Because really what else do you need to know? That's it. So for this video, of course, I had to do some digging because turns out there's plenty else that you can know about these little maggots and I bet that you're not going to like it. I found a paper called Intestinal Myiasis Caused by Aristolus Tenet which is their scientific name, of course. It describes a particular case of myiasis, which is essentially where a maggot becomes a parasite of a living human or other vertebrate animal feeding on internal tissues. It can happen in, I'm so sorry, in the skin, eyes, nasal cavity, in wounds, in other parts of the gastrointestinal tract. This particular case was intestinal. A woman in Spain was dizzy, had a little stomach ache, which pretty common, but also noticed them exiting her. I have a question for the God. What? Dude, the way the paper described her symptoms was fucking crazy. Because they were in that order. It was like, okay, so she was a little dizzy, she had a little stomach ache, and she was also shitting out maggots. Like, yeah, we have a case of maggots. No shit, Sherlock! How are you gonna put all of those on the same diagnostic level? <laughs> 
So that's it. I think you get the gist. I won't go more into detail. Actually, yes, I will. Let me tell you how she got them. Either the eggs were deposited on food that she ingested and they somehow survived the trip down, which is really rare. So the other option is they went in the other way. Who's to say? Regardless of how it happened, this does highlight just how adaptable some species are, doesn't it? I mean, these are the lineages that will live on long after humans are gone. Same goes for the tube effects worms. They have adapted to the sickest, most polluted corners of the earth that we created with our waste and found a way to thrive there. Whether we like it or not, these are some of evolution's greatest achievements. These are some of the most ideal forms. They saw some of the most godforsaken, decrepit places on earth and said, bet bitch. And for that, I respect them. And as for this next one, we should at least be grateful that humans are not the target. These are called horsehair worms, apparently named after an old legend that they came from horsehair that fell into a body of water and came to life. They're also known as Gordian worms because they can contort their bodies into knots that kind of look like the Gordian knot. I guess. They are obviously parasites that take over the bodies of insects and other related groups. Well, some, not all. You know, your crickets, your mantids, water beetles, dragonflies, millipedes, etc. And they need these hosts to complete their life cycle. They start out as an egg and hatch into pre-parasitic larva and then become parasitic larva inside of a host and then become a free living aquatic adult after the deed is done. Allow me to explain in greater detail. An insect accidentally eats the worm larva in a sticky string maybe undetected on a leaf and the larva settle into their new home, growing as they absorb nutrients from the insect's tissues. And eventually they must leave the insect's body to complete their life cycle and they don't do it kindly. Some species do this sort of mind control, take over the insect's brain and force it towards a body of water. The insect jumps into the water against its will and dies and the worms tear out of its body and start to lay eggs. So the process can begin again. That is at least the general idea because so much of their development takes place inside of an insect's body, scientists don't really see it happen. Most of what's known about this process is the videos that we see online of the worms tearing out of a fucking body. And luckily, because they are a parasite to only arthropods, they are completely harmless to us and other non-arthropod animals, the inarthropods. If you were to eat them for some godforsaken reason, you might just get a little stomach ache, but that's about it. So there you have it, that's it. I'd love to know your thoughts on these animals now after learning about them in greater detail. Did it make it better or worse? Let me know in the comments. And like I had mentioned in the last video on snake evolution, I am moving. So this is the last video with this particular setup. The new setup is gonna have the same general vibe and I'm definitely keeping the little whiteboard, but I wanna change up some things and kind of make it more intentional because this setup was kind of like, oh, I need a backdrop because I'm starting YouTube and uh, this is makeshift. So as we know, I love redecorating and so I'm very excited to get started on that. And if you like this video, be sure to subscribe so you see the end result of the redecorating journey. And you can keep up with my daily short form content on TikTok and Instagram. And a big thanks again to Set Bird for sponsoring this video. <laughs> yeah, boy. Check out their links below. And for now, stay curious. The world has a lot for us to learn. See ya! Try something. Rat tail maggots at your <clears throat> I can do it. Rat tail maggots! <laughs> it's a good thing I'm moving out. <laughs>